Hello everyone. So now we start with the cystic duct. The cystic duct is 3 to 5 cm in length. The same diagrams we can recall from the previous uh, lecture. This part highlighted here, this, this was the region as, as a cystic duct. It runs backwards and downwards. It extends from the neck of the gallbladder to the common hepatic duct. It joins it to form the bile duct. Joins the common hepatic duct just below the porta hepatis. Again, maybe as in some MCQs. The mucous membrane lining, its interior thrown, it, its interior is thrown into a series of concentric folds, which are five to twelve in number. Again, as in MCQs, which projects into the lumen in a spiral fashion, forming a spiral fold called spiral wall of Heister. This is again a very important question asked in exams. This spiral valve of Hister gives the cystic duct open to allow the passage both in and out of the gallbladder. This is a simple diagram, schematic diagram to show the spiral valve of Hister as we, it can be seen clearly in this diagram. Now, due to its presence, if the CBD or the common bile duct, if the CBD is closed at its inferior end, the bile secreted by the liver fills the duct and passes through it into the gallbladder. It is clearly evident and if the CBD is open, the bile flows into it from the common hepatic and the cystic ducts. So basically it is uh, allowing the, the presence of this spiral valve is allowing the uh, passage of this bile in this direction and then in back in this direction to and fro from the gallbladder as and when the situation is uh, required. Now we talk about the arterial supply, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and nerve supply of the entire extrahepatic biliary apparatus as a whole. Talking about the blood supply or the arterial supply first, cystic artery. This is the primarily or the chief artery which is uh, supplying the biliary apparatus. It commonly arises from the right hepatic artery again asked in MCQs. It is present in the triangle between the common hepatic duct, cystic duct and the visceral surface of the liver. Now here the term comes Callot's triangle. This is again a very very important question for the examination point of view and you will hear of this term again and again in whole of the MBBS during your final year as well as well as MCQs in surgery, in anatomy. This term will be repeatedly asked in so many uh, MCQs and exams. Now to talk about this in detail, this is a schematic diagram again to uh, label the uh, Callot's triangle. This Callot's triangle is also known as the cystohepatic triangle. The boundaries of this Callot's triangle is first the under surface of the liver superiorly as we can see from the diagram. Second the common hepatic duct left side, the common hepatic duct and then the cystic duct from the right side cystic duct so this forms the triangle here so as we have re been reading the triangles in any part of the human body the boundaries of the triangle are important as well as the contents so in this case the contents of cystohepatic triangle or the Callot's triangle are the cystic artery we can see from this diagram and the right hepatic artery the right hepatic artery and this cystic lymph node of Lund this this cystic this solitary node which is present here so these three primarily form the major contents of the Callot's triangle which is very important for this surgical point of view ligation of cystic artery in this triangle is one of the crucial steps in the surgical removal of the gallbladder the cholecystectomy <coughs> The identification of the Callot's triangle and its contents helps the surgeons to locate the pedicle of the gallbladder and its ligation in cholecystectomy as I already mentioned. Inability to appreciate the common variations of the extrahepatic biliary system often leads to major surgical complications and errors. Now there is a term known as Moynihan's hump. This is a extra edge thing which you can uh, remember if you, uh, if you can. Most frequently when uh, the right hepatic artery in this triangle presents a ca caterpillar like loop known as the Moynihan's hump which may be inadvertently clamped, ligated, 
along with the cystic reticle and cut leading to profuse bleeding so as we can see these variations and along with this one there are many variations which we will be talking about in the applied anatomy uh, region the uh, different uh, anomalies or the different uh, 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 the different things which uh, which are uh, variations from the normal uh, normal extra hepatic biliary system these are very important to be known for for any surgery for any surgeon now this moini hans hump or the caterpillar stern this was shown in this diagram we can see this turn this is the moini hans hump again this is the normal case and this here is the moini hans hump in the carrot triangle now moving on this again uh, diagram shows the blood supply of gallbladder and bile duct as a whole so in case if the uh, if there is a question in an exam you can uh, draw this diagram it feel if it feels uh, easy for you to draw so here we see the cystic artery which is primarily supplying the gallbladder the cystic artery is the chief source of supply to most parts of the extra hepatic biliary apparatus if we talk about the bile duct separately the blood supply of the bile duct as we can see this is the bile duct the bile duct is supplied from these two arteries this these two arteries are the major arteries there will be collaterals as well so this is the descending branch of the cystic artery labeled here and then this is the ascending branch of the superior pancreatic duodenal artery now the branches and everything will be covered in detail with the celiac trunk and everything so you have to revise that topic to get uh, acquainted with this uh, arterial supply here the same thing for this uh, diagram which we followed previously the left hepatic artery then right hepatic artery cystic artery cystic artery divides here to uh, to form the ventral branch and the dorsal branch or in some books it's shown superficial or the uh, dorsal uh, this uh, there are so uh, there are so many terms which are used for this cystic artery branches coming out to the venous drainage quickly the venous drainage is primarily by the cystic vein which drains into the portal vein and also there are numerous small veins which pass from the superior surface of the gallbladder to the liver through bed of gallbladder to drain into the hepatic veins lymphatic drainage the most part of the extra hepatic biliary apparatus are drained by the cystic lymph node of lund the located in the carrot triangle which we saw previously in the slides uh, and also nodes alongside upper part of the bile duct node at the anterior border of the epiploic foramen again as the mcq which finally drains into the celiac duct group the lower part of the bile duct drains into the lower hepatic and the upper pancreatico splenic nodes this is a uh, one liner which is asked cystic node is constantly enlarged in cholecystitis which is nothing but the inflammation of the gallbladder talking about the nerve supply now there may be some questions uh, framed uh, regarding the anatomical basis uh, of the referred pain so you have to go through the topic of referred pain uh, from the previous sections and um, uh, talking about the nerve supply here the cystic there is a cystic plexus which is formed by the sympathetic fibers from the T7 to T9 segments and the parasympathetic fibers right and left vagus nerve compare uh, comprising of majorly and the fibers of the right phrenic nerve clinically the gallbladder pain is referred to now this uh, this information is valuable for to practice as a general physician for your entire life so gallbladder pain uh, is referred to the inferior angle of the right scapula uh, due to the reason by the sympathetic fibers and tip of the right shoulder via the right phrenic nerve and the stomach by the vagus nerve so uh, talking about the uh, anatomical basis this uh, pain from the gallbladder may travel along the vagus and the sympathetic nerves and along the phrenic nerves this uh, this referred pain uh, can be explained by it uh, as first talking about the stomach through the vagus to the stomach uh, especially the epigastrium uh, we, we can have pain in the epigastrium region and through the sympathetic nerves to the inferior angle of the right scapula 
The lateral horn of the thoracic seven segment of the spinal cord gives sympathetic fibers to the celiac ganglion through the greater splanchnic nerves. T7 segment receives pain fibers from the skin over the inferior angle of the scapula. So visceral pain is referred to the somatic area. Through the phrenic to the right shoulder, C4 gives fibers to the phrenic nerve and to the supraclavicular nerves. This slide is a, a recapitulation of all the things which we have done previously. The artery cystic artery, vein cystic vein, the lymph node cystic lymph node of Lund and nerve cystic, ple uh, cystic plexus formed by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Now moving on to the bile duct or the common bile duct. <clears throat> this region encircled here is comprising of the bile duct. It is formed near the porta hepatis by the union of the cystic and the common hepatic ducts. The length is a 7.5 cm or roughly 3 inches and diameter is a 6 mm. Talking about the parts of the bile duct, there are primarily four parts. One is the supraduodenal part, then retroduodenal part, infraduodenal part and the intraduodenal part. The four parts can be better seen in this diagram. The previous diagram is for your exam purposes. You can draw this diagram if, it, if it's easy for you to draw, but you have to label it properly. The supraduodenal part, the retroduodenal part behind the duodenum, the infraduodenal part below the duodenum and the intraduodenal part, this region. Talking briefly about this, we do not have to go into details. The supraduodenal part, the length is 2.5 cm, it runs in right free margin of the lesser omentum. The retroduodenal part, it descends behind the first part of duodenum along with the gastroduodenal artery on its left and IVC or the inferior vena cava on its posterior aspect. The infraduodenal or the pancreatic part lies behind or embedded in the head of the pancreas. The intraduodenal or the intramural part comes in contact with the main pancreatic duct. This thing we saw in the previous uh, lecture in the three dimensional view. It comes in contact with the main pancreatic duct near the middle of the left side of the second part of the duodenum and accompanies it through the posterior medial wall of the duodenum. Within the wall, the two, these two ducts usually unite to form the hepatopancreatic ampulla or the famous terminology ampulla of waiter. You might have uh, heard of this term previously also. The distal constricted end of the ampulla opens at a summit of major duodenal papilla 8 to 10 cm distal to the pylorus. Now talking about the sphincters related to the bile and the pancreatic ducts, I have organized this thing for clarity, the intramural parts, the terminal parts of the bile and this uh, bile and the pancreatic ducts as well as the ampulla are surrounded by smooth muscle sphincters. Now there are three sphincters primarily. One is around the bile duct. I will be showing that these three sphincters in the next uh, slide in the diagram. Around the bile duct, sphincter choridocus or the sphincter of Boyden. Around the pancreatic duct, sphincter pancreaticus. Around the ampulla, sphincter ampullae. Or, or sphincter of odi. Again, which things I have highlighted in yellow are super important for exam purposes. These sphincters are independent of the duodenal musculature. The sphincters remain closed until the gastric contents enter the duodenum. As this thing we uh, saw in a, uh, uh, in a small statement in the previous lecture also. And uh, it's stimulating its mucosa to release the hormone called the CCK or the cholecystokinin. This hormone, in addition to the causing uh, the contraction of the gallbladder, relaxes these sphincters allowing bile and pancreatic secretions to enter the duodenum. Now, this is a diagram which you can again uh, reproduce in your exams if if it seems similar, to, uh, easy for you to draw. This was the uh, this is the bile duct. And uh, the, around the bile duct, we have the sphincter choridocus or sphincter of Boyden. There is second sphincter, sphincter pancreaticus, which is around the main pancreatic duct. Then we have the sphincter of Odai, which the sphincter of Odai, we can see the sphincter of Odai or sphincter ampullae around the ampulla region, this. Hepatopancreatic ampulla or ampulla of waiter, which we saw in the previous slides. 
now coming on to the applied anatomy now the first applied anatomy important which is this is known as cholecystitis inflammation of the gallbladder there is a term cystitis or itis the itis represents the inflammation so inflammation of the gallbladder it may be acute or chronic in case of acute cholecystitis again very important from surgical point of view you will be seeing uh, cases during your final year postings uh, this is uh, usually present in the adult woman characterized by primarily the sudden pain in the right hypochondrium referred to the inferior angle of the right scapula or the tip of the right shoulder vomiting and positive Murphy sign again this is one of the important questions asked in Viva so I have highlighted the thing in the red so you can go through it and make notes from this slide if the finger is pressed under the right costal margin at the tip of the ninth costal cartilage when the patient is asked to take a deep breath he or she feels sharp pain and winces with a catch in the breath as the deceased gallbladder meets the examining finger this has to be uh, demonstrated in a patient for better clarity now these symptoms of cholecystitis are aggravated on taking fatty meals so hence we advise the patients uh, not to take the fatty meals uh, because the gallbladder contracts to pour the bile into the duodenum when fat reaches the duodenum the fat in the duodenum induces liberation of cckpz uh, cholecystokinin pancreozymin uh, which uh, reaches the gallbladder through the bloodstream and stimulates its contraction and then there may be chronic cholecystitis which uh, which leads to the formation of stones in the gallbladder or the cholelithiasis now this is a new term for you i guess the stones in the presence of stones in the gallbladder is known as cholelithiasis lithiasis is a term uh, to say about the stones presence of stones now there is a typical uh, presentation which is seen uh, and it is you will be hearing this in surgical postings as well it is usually occurs or typically occurs in fat uh, in 5f fat fertile flatulous female of 40 these are some things you can fancy things you can remember if you see an ultrasonographic picture of a cholecystitis a patient of cholecystitis in the normal case we will see like the gallbladder like this it will be uh, a black shadow in between and the wall focus on the wall right now it is very thin and now focus on the wall this is the inflammation of the gallbladder it may or may not be evident sometimes but uh, uh, this image you can get an idea of how it will look cholelithiasis uh, uh, or the gallstones presence of gallstones when we do an ultrasonography it is present uh, with the stones present can be seen here like this in uh, in the previous slide we, we saw that this was the black shadow we see the presence of multiple stones here in the form of white shadows and uh, this is a gallbladder which is taken out and uh, the stones can be seen talking about the referred pain which we have already discussed you have to go uh, through this topic uh, in depth from your side as well acute cholecystitis may cause irritation of the subdiaphragmatic parietal peritoneum supplied by the phrenic nerves c3 c4 c5 spinal segments thus referred pain over the tip of the right shoulder for being supplied by supraclavicular nerves c3 and c4 spinal segments I'm talking about the biliary colic what do you understand by biliary colic that it is a result of the spasm it is basically a pain which is felt in the patient uh, result of the spasm of smooth muscle of gallbladder wall in an attempt to expel the stone, gallstone it is intermittent and most intense when the stone is impacted either at the terminal endocystic duct or at the lower end of the bile duct the afferent pain fibers from the gallbladder enter the thoracic segments of the spinal cord and hence referred pain is felt in the right upper quadrant or the epigastrium the dermatome again dermatomes t7 to t9 are important talking about the term coverziers law again this term will be repeated again in surgical postings as well and in the final prof so you have to go through this topic uh, this is very important for a viva the state uh, this law states that obstructive jaundice with distended so patient is coming to you with jaundice there may be two scenarios with distended and palpable gallbladder so in if 
this is the presentation this is likely due to the extrinsic obstruction of the CBD like the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas so that means if there is a patient with jaundice and with distended and palpable gallbladder so the cause is not likely to be the presence of gallstones which is uh, if you don't know this thing then you, uh, you might misinterpret on the contrary if there is a presence of obstructive jaundice with again the obstructive jaundice can be seen from the uh, uh, liver function enzymes as well and uh, tests also so the obstructive jaundice with the uh, non distended and non palpable gallbladder is due to the intrinsic obstruction of the CBD here comes the impaction by the gallstones so because in this case previous cystitis makes the gallbladder fibrotic and contracted so hence the gallbladder is not palpable and not distended and the patient presentation is different in both cases there will be ob obstruction of the CBD Due to, the, due to the presence of gallstones, pancreatic carcinoma or the enlarged neoplastic hepatic lymph nodes. It causes obstruction to the bile flow which leads to jaundice. <coughs> now we will be uh, skimming through some slides to just have a uh, understanding of the some terms which you will be hearing about in uh, uh, final prof in surgical postings. There is a term known as ERCP, there is a term known as MRCP. ERCP stands for the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. The word graphy is used. So we are uh, we are visualizing the uh, endoscopically this uh, system of the biliary uh, biliary. Uh, you don't have to go into the details right now, but just uh, get acquainted to the words. ERCP is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography then there is a term known as MRCP magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography using the MRI scans the magnetic word is there magnetic resonance so uh, there also may be some anomalies of the gallbladder again you don't have to go into much details right now but uh, there may be a genesis of the gallbladder double gallbladder connected by single and separate cystic ducts or separate gallbladder this two images are shown and maybe intrahepatic inside the liver intrahepatic gallbladder or a mobile or a floating gallbladder then there will be variations in the formation of the bile duct the, this is uh, a diagram showing the Hartman's pouch and uh, there may be variations in termination of the bile duct again uh, we don't have to go into much details but yes the knowledge of all these variations is important surgically because otherwise it may lead to major complications if uh, there is a accidental ligation of certain arteries this is a normal picture this is this image is taken from the Gray's anatomy normal anatomy of the cystic artery and then there may be some variations in the cystic artery as well thank you